leadership development, strategic planning, and culture development initiatives. He specializes in helping small to medium-sized construction-related companies develop next-gen leaders. Brian has worked directly with more than 250 leaders across several companies in the last two years. Prior to starting his own practice, Brian worked for Dame Leadership, Shop, Soccer Shots Franchising, and Journal Me Multimedia, where he installed leadership training programs, a variety of assessments, culture building activities, and led sales and marketing operations. These efforts help companies grow revenues and profits while decreasing turnover and improving employee satisfaction. So, thank you, Brian. Turn over. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to move around if that's okay. A uh, couple ground rules. Ground rule number one if you can't hear me, just say speak up. Okay, let's, let's do a practice. One, two, three, I want to hear you say speak up. One, two, three, speak, speak up. up. Okay, good. Another, ground rule number two, if you have a question, interrupt me. And so we're just going to practice that real quick. I'm going to say one, two, three, and then I want to say, I want to hear you say, I have a question. Ready? One, two, three. I have a question. Good. All right. We're, this is going to be awesome. Now, <laughs> as I understand it, I have until 1.15, and i got to be done, right? Yep. Well, with sure. And then questions. And then, and then some questions. Then questions after 1.15. Yeah. Awesome. Super. <clears throat> Uh, the topic for today is accountability. And I wanted to talk first about this quote up on screen. It's from Dwight Eisenhower, and it is, leadership is the art of getting people to want to do that which must be done. Now that makes accountability a lot easier, but that's also simultaneously really hard. So show of hands, raise your hand if you are in charge of leading or influencing other humans currently in, in your current role. Could be a family member, okay. One more show of hands if you are actively involved in a leadership position in a business. Okay, fewer hands. So today's presentation is gonna cover both aspects. I'm gonna move quickly and uh, you know, tell me to slow down, ask a question if you got something along the way. I did a LinkedIn online event, and I asked the participants, what's one behavior you wish you had more of in your business? And the response is populated a word cloud, and so the two number one uh, answers of the group is accountability and ownership. So this is a common need that, that leaders want from their employees in their business. They want their employees to demonstrate accountability and ownership. So today we're gonna talk about how. I want to talk about three things. Number one, a mindset for accountability. Number two, I want to talk about structures you need for accountability. I don't care if it's a large business or a small not-for-profit team. There are certain structures you need in place so that you can get the accountability. And then once we have the mindset, then we have the structures, we will talk about tactics. Tactics to help you get accountability. First, the mindset. I like. I normally, in my practice, I do not equivocate young people with adult employees. But I'm gonna break my rule right now, and I want you all to imagine a hypothetical. Imagine you have a young person living under your roof, and they are going to go out for the evening, and you want to ensure that they get back before curfew. First question, what is a reasonable curfew for this young person theoretically living under your roof? 11. 11 p.m., very common answer, okay. So, next step, let's establish what 11 p.m. really means. I mean, if the person is in the neighborhood at 11 p.m., is that okay? <coughs> no, okay. So if the person is on your property, they're just milling around on the front porch or in the driveway, is that okay? No. no, okay. So I think what I hear you say is when the clock strikes 11 p.m., you want them in the front door with the door closed behind them and latched. Is that fair? Yes. Okay, very good. So we have now clarified our expectation of what it means to be back by 11 p.m. Now that young person goes off with their friends into the night, and my question is this. Who is the only person that can truly get that young person back in the door by 11 p.m.? That person. That person. Outside of you sending a SWAT team to put lay hands on the person, it's the young person who has to get themselves back in the door. And yet, 
as business leaders, as team leaders, as family leaders, we tend to think we're in this movie. Where there, and anybody knows who, who this is? Who's there? Cinderella. Cinderella. And what happened when Cinderella missed her curfew? Um, All bad things, right? All bad things magically occurred to hold Cinderella accountable for getting back into the house. So we don't live in this movie. We live in the real world. And we're going to talk about real world things. It starts with self. I have to hold myself accountable before I can move on to holding anybody else accountable. And my fundamental role is to help others hold themselves accountable. That's a key part of the mindset. Um, this is a great quote. You know, good teams, the coaches hold people accountable. On great teams, the players hold each other accountable. Okay, so I got self, and now I got peers. Peers who are responsible for holding each other accountable. This is, uh, anybody know who Patrick Lencioni is? Somebody please say yes. My hero. Five dysfunctions of, Five dysfunctions of a team. Have you done his most recent one, the six working geniuses? I have not. It's life changing. You need to do it. <laughs> I'm serious. I, and I'll walk you through it later. But Patrick says the peer pressure of reporting to my peers how I'm doing on my goals is more powerful than the authoritative pressure from my boss. And it's true. So we've got self-accountability, we've got accountability from our peers, and then we have this idea. It's from a book, and it says, never let a good boss make a mistake. This introduce, introduces a third level, a third layer of accountability. And what this says is that subordinates are actually responsible for holding their bosses accountable. And at first that feels a little Little, little uncomfortable, but let me ask you this. If you imagine yourself as a manager, would you ever want your subordinates to knowingly let you make a mistake? And every manager I ask that question to is like, no way. I would want those subordinates to keep me from making a mistake. I'm like, okay, how about your boss? When you see your boss make a mistake, when was the last time you told him about it? He was like, oh, I don't have that conversation. And it's like, that's not fair. You can't expect it from your subordinates and not offer it up chain. So what we have is we've established now within the mindset of accountability. I have to hold myself accountable. My peers are gonna hold me accountable. And then I've got subordinates who are also involved in helping me <coughs> stay the path. And so when I get this question, I get it all the time, Brian, how do I hold them accountable? My answer is be last in line. There should be a long line. So I've got this person, they have to hold themselves accountable. They've got their peer group holding them accountable. They've got subordinates holding them accountable, and now I'm last in line, and I'm just simply asking the question, hey, how can I help you take more ownership in the commitments you've made? But if you don't have this mindset, the structures and the tactics won't work. Does that make sense? Okay, let's move on to just a couple things. As leaders, we need to first own our own attitudes, our impacts, our consequences, and then like I said, it's all about how I can help other people do the same thing I'm doing. Just hold themselves accountable. All right, structure. This is going to be my favorite part of the presentation. You're going to see me look at my watch a lot to make sure I don't get bogged down. Okay? There's a lot, bunch of books out there. Anybody in the room running EOS from the book Traction by Gino Wickman? Anybody running Four Disciplines of Execution? Okay. Today is your lucky day. Today is the day, what is it, March 17th, is the first day you got to hear about these books. I get to be the guy that tells you about them. These are all different books on structures that help businesses establish goals and establish structures and procedures for hitting those goals. It transforms businesses. I would say the most popular up here is traction. Uh, the second one is probably measure what matters. There's a bunch of them. I'm going to walk you through real quick because I get clients coming to me saying, I heard about EOS, this book Traction by Gino Wickman. I want to do that too. And I say, listen, I've been running Traction with, with dozens of companies for years now. I love Traction, but tell me why. Why do you want Traction? Why not one of these other books? So let's look at what they have in common. I'm just going to compare these three because it's very important for the subject of accountability for you to understand 
what it takes to move people towards a goal. They all have a lot of commonalities. They have periodic goals. The goals might range from 90 days to one year, to three year, to five year, to 10 year goals. But they have long-term goals. They all have them. In traction, they're called rocks. In core disciplines of execution, they're called wigs or wildly important goals. In measure what matters, they're called OKRs or objectives and key results. They all have goals. The next thing they have is weekly activities that predict the future. Okay, these are weekly human-based activities that predict the future. The, my favorite one, how many people are in sales? Salespeople, yes, I love salespeople. So salespeople, if I don't prospect, that's gonna predict a future revenue problem. If I'm not doing my sales calls and getting a certain volume of proposals out, that's gonna predict a future revenue problem. So these are really important activities to be tracking and we can make those for all the areas in the business. The next third thing all these books have in common is that they have a very visible way of tracking progress towards the goals and weekly activities. This is pulling that lever of peer pressure. Because when we have a billboard that every employee in the company can see how I'm tracking towards my goals, it makes it very easy for my boss. Because he is after work, he can use that peer pressure that's gonna motivate me to not let my team members down. So this highly visible progress thing, it's called a VTO, Vision Traction Organizer, in, in the book Traction, Scoreboard, and Four Disciplines, a Dashboard. They have different names for the same thing. The next one. This is a little bit difficult for some managers to stomach at first, but they have a weekly management meeting to look at the highly visible progress reporting to check on the weekly activities and to monitor progress. And that, that weekly meeting ranges from 30 minutes to 90 minutes per week. And it's worth it. Now, that's just books, right? It's just books, Brian. You're saying, okay, you read a few books, you found some similarities. All right, next slide. Oh, sorry, there's one more thing that each of these books have. I'm not gonna get into this today, but they got different tools for measuring employee fit and effectiveness. Here's the data. McKinsey went out and looked at what were companies doing that successfully achieved great transformations. Great transformations could be they launched into a new market or launched a new product or did something that really moved the needle for the business. What they have in common, and would you be surprised executive level weekly briefings. They had goals and performance monitoring. They set targets on a regular basis and they had an annual planning and budgeting process. Directly in alignment with the, what the, all those books are preaching. So those are the structures you've got to have in place to make sure that you can have accountability in your team, in your work group, or in your company. Now, I'm not satisfied with that. I like to dig, dig deeper. So this is just entertain my nerdiness for a little bit because I was like, I see some connections here. Because these systems come to the conclusions that they need goals, weekly activities, a highly visible thing, and weekly meetings, not by accident. They're pulling on basic, fundamental human psychology levels. And so I want to introduce you to some of the greats that influenced my thinking. This is Ellie Goldrack. Lived in Israel. Uh, he passed a few years ago. I got to hear him speak live before he did. And he said, um, if you can believe it, living in Israel, there's no such thing as conflict. <laughs> you know where you live, buddy? But he had, um, he had a great management system for reducing inventory turns. And it, it was in his book, you know, the, the, the idea is the theory of constraints. He said the number one constraint in any business is management attention. Here's what I found. Uh, she does that from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> management attention, and it's absolutely true. And what you will find is excruciating about those three books is they take your goals list and they crunch it down. And it forces you to prioritize 
the top most important goals and only focus on those. And the reason, like Emily says, the number one constraint of any business is management attention. So we have to focus that management attention. That's why these things work. Next guy. This is Elliot Jacks. He had this book, The Requisite Organization. And he emphasized time span, which is basically the human ability to think and work towards something in the future, and it varies by leadership level. And your frontline people need shorter term goals, like weekly activities, and your leaders need longer term goals, like 90 days is most appropriate for most management, and for the executive management, they're effective at planning out one, five, 10 years down the road. And so it lines up with what Elliot said about people's capacity to plan in the future. He also had this uh, managerial accountability hierarchies. And basically what that says is that very important for me to have one and only one boss. And establishes like that structure and eliminating the dotted lines in the organization. And you can see down here, I'm sorry for the folks way down there, but basically this guy X holds Y accountable for Y's of personal effectiveness and Y's subordinates actual results. But establishing this structure in, in an organization so everybody knows real clearly what I'm responsible for and who's accountable for me. Super key for accountability. Last guy, this guy, Robert Chaldean. I get jealous when I see somebody with that much hair. <laughs> I mean, come on. Exactly. So Robert wrote this book, Influence. The revised version recently came out uh, in the last year or two. If you wanted to listen to the audiobook, which I have a couple times, it's like nine hours of life. It's worth it though, because what he does, he's a psychologist, and he looks at the psychology the psychological things that are in play with marketers get other people to say yes. It is highly, highly relevant for us as leaders. And so basically, if I could sum it up in a nutshell, if you have a goal, okay, you wanna achieve something, you got that in your head, you got a chance of hitting it, because you might think about it from time to time. If you take the goal that's in your head and you write it down, just write it down, your chances go up. You take the goal that was in your head, you write it down, and you share it with a group of people, and your chances go up. This is just basic psychological construct. But if you take the goal that was in your head, you wrote it down, you shared it with a group, and you have a cadence, like a weekly meeting, to check in on your progress, your chances go even higher. 90%. It's, it's very high. and it, 10% it's, if it's just in your head. 10% if it's just in your head. So as leaders, why would you not pull these levers to make your job easier? So why do these things work? It focuses the management attention, like Goldratt said, quickly resolves conflict. We don't have time to get into that right now. Cascades the vision from a five-year goal to a one-year goal to 90 days to one week to even one-day goals. Makes it really simple so that my goal for this week lines up with a very long-term vision. And it's beautiful. I have an answer to the question, why is this so important? Why? Because this is going to get us incrementally closer to a beautiful future. Clarifies the managerial accountability hierarchies. It leverages basic human dynamics. This is how humans work. I, I, my father-in-law is an uh, engineer for the Army Corps of Engineers. And he said, if I could just do the engineering work and not do all the people stuff, my life would be perfect. <laughs> and and man, I'm like, I don't like that world. Because that world requires robots, and that means leaders are out of a job. And so as leaders, we have to embrace this human side of business. Uh, this is just kind of a visual illustration. I got time. So this is what I love doing with clients. We paint the picture of where they are today, right? Then, I have them envision a 10-year target way out there. Sometimes it's only five years. And we need that target to make this line for a path to get there. And then we sit down with the team and we create a vivid three-year picture. And I usually have one of those big tablets. And I imagine the company photo three years down the road. 
How many people are in the photo? What kind of building is in the background? You got vehicles in there? Is there some sort of radio tower on top? Tell me what the, what is the picture of your business three years down the road look like so that we can build a one-year plan that lines up with the three-year picture that lines up with the 10-year target. Fascinating thing happens. Things they put on the three-year picture list end up coming over to the one-year plan. Things on the one-year plan end up here, the 90 days in front of our face. And if we hadn't done the exercise in that sequence, we would have missed something really important for the business. I digress. I'll move on. This is uh, a picture from EOS. They have an accountability chart system. I won't get bogged down here, but having that direct line of accountability, knowing who my boss is, who's allowed to say that's good enough, that's not good enough, super, super key. This is an EOS tool for measuring and quickly answering the question, is the person in our organization in right for our company? Are they the right person? Are they in the right seat? Once you have the structures of core values established, and you have the hierarchy of accountability established. It makes it very simple to answer questions. Do we have the right person? And is that right person in the right seat for the organization? All right, let's move to tactics. So I only have a few minutes left. Number one tactic I can encourage you to, to embrace. It's difficult. On the front end, it's gonna take a little bit more time. But it's literally life-changing, is the coaching approach. Okay, so how many people played sports in college? What did you play? Soccer and baseball. Soccer and baseball? Gymnastics. Cross country. Cross country? Gymnastics. Gym gymnastics, okay. Could you do the thing where you like that? So I want you to just take your idea of a scholastic coach and set it aside. I had a high school wrestling coach that has tainted the word coach for me for many years. And after a bunch of therapy, I've been able to move on. But when I'm talking about coaching in relationships, this is what I mean. I'm using questions to lead someone on the path of self-discovery so that they can think different and act different. Okay? It's difficult sometimes. But this is what I encourage you to do. I'm gonna give you a micro lesson in coaching here in a second. I always like to back up my case. Anybody know who this guy here is? Yep. Who is he? Former SEAL. Former SEAL. 20 years in the SEALs. Jocko Willink. Uh, his energy drink there is, you know, on the table. <laughs> I get nothing from that promotion, okay, at all. But I'm a huge fan. He's got podcasts. If you want to hear the case for using questions, instead of barking orders, I encourage you to set aside three and a half hours of your time and listen to 286, because that's his whole thing. You, we think military, especially elite military forces, as barking orders and screaming at people. Granted, that is done in like when they're going through boot camp, but boot camp is not about, it's about like whittling the group down. Once they get through boot camp, and we've proven they're strong enough, we don't bark orders and, and scream anymore. We use questions. So I'll walk you through an exercise real quickly. I go through with leaders all over the place because they want to say something like, you fool. <laughs> they want to say, get it together. They want to say, you got to be kidding me. And if I'm being honest, say again, I work with construction companies. There's some F words. <laughs> yeah. okay, that's just being honest. Yeah. And so I, as I'm helping them embrace, this is what they want to do. I'm like, write it down. Write down the thing that you want to do. Because we're going to transform these ideas into closed-ended questions and open-ended questions. Okay? First, closed-ended questions. Both are needed. Is that the only option you have? Or maybe we need to drop the common ground and I need to look at, hey, we all want things to go well, right? Hey, we can both agree that we want everybody on the team to go home safely, right? We can both agree we want to hit our goals. We can both agree, I want you to get paid more in the future. Where's my common ground? There are some closed-ended questions which are not appropriate. Are you kidding? Does it look like I care? <laughs> not appropriate, okay? Then we've got open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are things like, 
What's the end goal here? How does that help us achieve our goals? This is my favorite of all time. I use it all the time. What would you do differently? Sometimes I'll add, if you got to rewind the tape, which I'm sorry doesn't work for something, that was a digital recording device that we grew up with. Okay. It's actually with tapes, but like, if you got to rewind the tape or go back in time, what would you do differently? I'll come back to that in a second. I just want to say there is at least one open-ended question that I was raised on growing up that I don't think is appropriate for coaching, and that's, what's wrong with you? <laughs> it technically is an open-ended question. It starts with what or how. I can't answer it in one word, but it's just not going to work in a coaching situation. Now, my, I'll conclude the mini lesson um, with this. The art of coaching is bouncing from open-ended questions to closed-ended questions. I was just in a major manufacturing plant in Carlisle yesterday, recounting the story of how I'd been there a year before, sitting down with a manager who got a request from a colleague, and she decided, well, I'll give him the answer, and shot off an email that upset a whole bunch of people, and then she had to go in and talk to HR about, you know, sensitivity and whatnot. And so I'm asking, the, I'm sitting down with this person, and I'm like, tell me, if you got to rewind the tape, what would you do differently? She said, I don't know. There's nothing else I could do. I was like, ah, okay. And now I bounce to the close-ended question, and I say, are you telling me that's the only option you had? Which is a leading question, but it forces her to think a little bit, because every, you know, it's pretty common knowledge, like, the only option I had is probably not the right answer, so I probably had other options, and it took her a while to sit there. We're sitting in her office. I'm looking at the doorway with the hallway down the hall to the person she needed to talk to. I'm looking at the phone sitting on her desk, and I was like, really? That's the only option you had? And she's like, well, I guess I could have walked down the hall. I was like, yes, we went from zero options to one. What else could you have done? And I go back to the well with an open-ended question. She's like, I'm not sure. I'm like, you only had two options there? Close-ended question. She says, and I'm looking at the phone, looking at the phone, and she's like, yeah, I guess I could have picked up the phone too. I was like, okay, great. We are using questions to lead this person on the path of self-discovery so that she can think different and act different in the future. And so it's, it, it takes some time. Get used to awkward silence, okay? And if you want practice with awkward silence, I recommend going into career day in high school. <laughs> it's awesome. So I did this for my daughter's school, and I had two classrooms I had to talk to. The first one was hers, with all of her crony friends, you know. So I asked a question, I got silence. I was like, I, I can do this all day. I'm a consultant, I'm trained in the art of awkward silence. So. They stay silent. I was like, okay, I'm calling you guys out. I just want to see, like, call out what you're doing. And she shared with me later, like, yeah, that's the team's like collective passive aggressive anti authority <laughs> tactic. So, at any rate, the, the idea here before I wrap it up is that taking a coaching approach, I'm using questions. Because in that scenario, in that plant in Carlisle, if I had just been like, well, you should have picked up the phone. Well, you should just walk down the hall and talk to him. That's not her idea. Mm -hmm. now, now we're in this adversarial thing. I need those ideas to come up from inside her head because she's going to be much more attached to them than if I just mm -hmm. ran it down her throat. Hope that makes sense. So today, we talked about the mindset. We talked about structures. If you want to talk more about the structures, Sean's got my contact information. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, and we talked about the tactic of great questions. That's 115. Let's open it up for some questions. <coughs> yeah? It's just because I have a really bad memory. The Jocko podcast, what number was it? Because by the time it's on my phone, I forgot the number. Right, right. 286. 286, thank nope. you. And if you want a really good just overview of leadership and hear him riff on like, Condense his book into like a couple hours. 302 is another great one. Another great one. Yeah. And along with Jocko Willink, I, I, I saw another.
leadership podcast, and they were talking about how the Navy SEALs decide who they're going to put yeah. in leadership. Yeah. And they're not looking. They, they do a matrix of competence and teamwork, yeah. and they will throw the competent guy over the side every time yeah. in search of the person who is bringing their peers along, working in the group, yeah. more accountable for the group than the, the highly skilled operator who can shoot and swim and run and do all those other things. I actually have that video on a, another slide deck that's up. I could play it in a second, provide a second. But yeah, it's what's really interesting about that video. Um, Simon Sinek. Yes, does that's it. the guy. And, that's the guy. And, it, and it's um, you would think. So if you're looking at a scale, right? So the, I'm the x. This is the the y axis. This is the x axis. Okay. This is character and trustworthiness. This is performance. Okay. And so everybody wants the guy out here that's high character, high trust, and high performance. Very difficult to find. Okay, nobody wants this guy who's low, low trust, low performance. Okay, and so we got our axis here. But what you're going to find is that you will be. It's very easy to find this person who is high performance, low trust, low character. Everybody, everybody values this person, and they're toxic. They cause all sorts of problems in the organization, and they're actually very easy to find. Because you walk into any team, and you say, who's the jerk? And everybody points <laughs> at that person. And so what the SEALs found is that it's very difficult to find the high trust, high performance. They would rather have medium performance, high trust, maybe even low performance, high trust, it's a relative scale of the SEALs, than this person who is high performance, low trust. Because that person is toxic, they will tear your organization down. And that's the SEALs. So, ever more true for us. Thanks. Yeah. Whoa. Thank you.